Uh, any doubts from the previous class? Anything which are not clear about? Okay, if no doubts, then we can continue guys. Okay, so next topic, what we are going to discuss is basically Azure Monitor, okay? Uh, so Azure Monitor is common for all the services, okay? So we can use that service to detect what are the changes which are happening on the virtual machines, okay? So let's say if you have a virtual machine and you have certain utilization, okay, then, um, you can use Azure Monitor to detect those changes. OK, also a very important thing, a very important part of Azure Monitor is basically uh, first thing is the metrics. OK, so you can track periodic data. OK, so you can track or track periodic data. That means whatever data has been uh, utilized, whatever uh, has been utilized, you can track those. Second thing is you can set up something called alerts. OK, so if let's say, for example, uh, CPU utilization of a certain server, OK, certain VM is going high. OK, let's say if it is going about 90 percent most of the times, OK, most of the times, then set up an uh, alert, OK, set up an alert in order to uh, uh, like in order to say, OK, the the CPU utilization is high and you want to be notified. OK, so that is one way of doing it. OK, so this is uh, what we are going to do. OK, I will show you how to create an alert. OK, so you create a Windows virtual machine. OK, so you will have to create a Windows machine. OK, Windows VM. OK, and I will show you how to stress it. OK, stress in the sense create a CPU utilization. OK, so I will show you how to create a stress on the uh, virtual machine. So you have a tool called CPU stress test. OK, which is a uh, um, Microsoft tool itself. OK, you can create uh, like a stress. Uh, you can create uh, like uh, add CPU utilization and all those things. OK, so this is the tool which I'm talking about. This will create a uh, uh, environment wherein the CPU utilization is going to be very, very high. OK, so I will show you how to do that. Before that, I will show you how to set up an alert. OK, so first let's go to monitor. OK, first let me power on this virtual machine. So this is my Windows One virtual machine. I'll click on start. OK, so once I start this, OK, there is going to be a certain utilization that is going to happen. OK, so first let's uh, let me show you how to monitor these aspects. OK, so when you talk about the monitoring perspective, OK, there are certain things which you need to take care about. One is called uh, the first thing which you need to take care is basically CPU utilization. OK, the second thing is uh, memory. OK, and then the IOPS that is this is related to the disk. OK, this is related to disk and the next one is bandwidth. What is the uh, data which is being flown? OK, so that is also with, re with respect to disk. OK, and when you talk about the fifth aspect that is going to be the network in. OK, network in and the sixth aspect is going to be network out. OK, so if you are clear with these terminologies, OK, what all they are going to do? OK, what is the thing? OK, then you will be able to identify a performance based issue. OK, if it is there is high CPU, if there is memory, if there is IOPS, bandwidth, network in and network out. Now, can you guys tell me? OK, I will give you a VM size. OK, I just want you guys to figure out. OK, let's say this is the VM size. Standard DS1 V2. OK, I'm going to give you this particular VM size. Can you guys tell me what is the IOPS and bandwidth limit. OK, so just try to figure out. OK, I want you guys to analyze this particular VM and figure out what exactly is going to be the IOPS limit and the bandwidth limit for this particular VM. OK, so how, how are you guys going to find out? OK, just take two to three minutes. It's very simple, straightforward. You can use Google for this purpose. OK, just try to figure out what is the IOPS and throughput or bandwidth of this particular VM. OK, this is the size which I've given DS1 V2 is the size. What is the IOPS and throughput limit of this particular VM? You can start.
So if anyone has the answer, uh, please let me know. What is the IOPS and bandwidth limit of this particular virtual machine? DS1, V2. Uh, bandwidth maybe 2.4 gigahertz. 2.4? Gigahertz. Uh, how did you find that out? From the processor. Uh, no, no. 2.4 uh, GB is it? 2.4 G headset is what you're trying uh, to say. Giga uh, heads. Uh, that is processor, right? Yeah, that is processor. No, no. I no, thought no, that no. may be the bandwidth. No, no, no. 32 MB. 32? MB. How did you find that out? Read write speed. Uh, where is that? Uh, that uh, I have Google that is standard DS1 V2 specification. Mm -hmm. There it shows combined write, combined read speed is uh, 32 MB per second for mm -hmm. both the Okay, fine. Almost. And uh, IOPS, IOPS yeah. uh, input output processing speed is 4000. What is that? But there is no uh, unit, only 4000 it has given. Okay, that is correct. Okay, so so when you see that uh, when you see that um, link, right? One minute, I'll open the same link. Azure, yeah. PS one. So our size is DS one V two, right? DS1 V2 is our size. So this capacity of the virtual machine is one vCPU. OK, the memory is going to be 3.5 gigabytes of RAM. OK, and apart from that, you have a temporary storage, which is 7 GB. OK, and the maximum number of data disk, which you can add is for four data disks. OK, so when you talk about the caching uh, IOPS and uncached IOPS, OK, the IOPS basically stands for input output per second. OK, IOPS is input output per second. OK, so input output per second. OK, the unit is going to be in megabytes. OK, I, unit of IOPS is going to be in megabytes. OK, and what is the uh, throughput which is going to flow? That is going to be basically 32, 32 GB per second. Oh, sorry, uh, megabytes per second. 32 megabytes per second is your throughput for this particular virtual machine. OK, so when you talk about uncached, OK, when it is cached, this is 4000 and when it is uncached, it is going to be 3200 and there is going to be an increase in the Mbps, which is going to be 48. OK, 48 would be the Mbps. OK, so when you say this is the cached and uncached limit, so up, uh, like when you're trying to transfer something or download something. This is the speed which you are going to receive 32 MBBS, 48 MBBS or 4000 IOPS. OK, so that is the maximum uh, um, data which can you can receive when you are trying to do an operation okay like a copy or a robocopy job or anything whatever the operation that is this is going to be the maximum amount of data which is going to flow okay so now uh, once this is done okay you this is how you figure out what is the limit okay now can you tell me i have a disk attached to this okay i have a disk so what is going to be the iops of this particular disk so there are two types of limits when you talk about the iops limit and throughput limit throughput is again another word for bandwidth okay so iops and bandwidth okay i'm just writing bw this belongs falls into two categories one is on the vm limit okay which we just checked right now and the second thing is going to be on the disk level okay disk limit so either if one of those parameters are breached okay let's say if there is a data transfer of around uh, 64 mbps okay let's just say that it's happening so then the performance of the vm will come down okay that will cause high cpu utilization high memory utilization and everything okay so what we need to make sure is both the limits the vm limit which we checked here okay and the disk limit okay disk limit you can very well see it here 
500 is the maximum IOPS. Maximum throughput is going to be 100 Mbps. Okay, so both the limit should you should make sure that it should not breach. Okay, so that is the basic concept of operating while you are doing on your virtual machine. Any operations on your virtual machine, make sure that the IOPS and bandwidth limit are not reached. Okay, how do you figure that out? Coming back to what we started, the monitoring concept. Okay, so this is my monitoring metrics. I go to metrics. I'll show you again. That was fast. So. I go to properties. I go to monitoring here. I go here. Okay. Go to CPU average. Okay. And this is my virtual machine CPU. Okay. So when you click on this, okay, you're going to click on this. You will be able to see a lot of the parameters. Okay. Lot of parameters are going to be here. So depending on what is required, we will be able to filtering it out. Okay. So let's say I want a max. Okay, what is the max utilization? This is the max utilization. Okay, and if I want a summation for CPU, there is no summation. Okay, so depending on what my parameter is, okay, depending on what I need, okay, I can filter out. No, we are talking about IOPS. Okay, we are talking about IOPS. So you have data disk, you have OS disk on this virtual machine. Do I have data disk? No, I don't have data disk. Only OS disk is going to be there. So OS disk IOPS consumed percentage. What is the percentage consumed? Okay, I have not used anything, so it is very, very less. It is around three to four percent. Okay. And uh, when I talk about bandwidth, OS disk bandwidth consumed percentage. What is the bandwidth? Out of the 32 GB, I have 32 MBBS, I have used only three percentage of it. Okay. So that means I have a lot more uh, which I can use. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is this is one way of monitoring your virtual machine. Okay. You can monitor everything. Whatever resource you have on Azure, you will be able to monitor it. But make sure you are using the relevant um, charts. Okay. So let's say I want to pull up data for last 30 days. Okay. So you will be able to see that the machine or la last on these dotted lines mean that the virtual machine was in stop state. Okay. Only the lines which are like joint. Okay. They, these are the ones which are the actual ones. Okay. And uh, yeah, so may these dotted lines means the virtual machine was not either there or it was not running. Okay. So all these parameters, the main ones are uh, network in network out and um, CPU. Okay, CPU is one major aspect percentage CPU. Okay, and usually when we talk about CPU, make sure that the CPU percentage of your VM is above below 80%. If it is above 80%, then me, that means that the size which you are using is not the correct size and the utilization is high. Okay, so that is one way of uh, monitoring your virtual machine. Okay, so I will quickly put some stress onto this particular virtual machine. Okay, so RD, I'll first RDP into it. Okay, and username and password. I'll RDP into this and I will create a stress. Okay, so I'll just download this particular thing. I will show in folder and copy this particular thing. Okay. So once I finish copying and I put it onto this particular virtual machine, okay, I will generate a fake stress. Okay, so let's see how that is going to happen. Okay, so once this is ready, I will just generate a stress and then we can see it. So now let us say I want to resize this particular virtual machine. Okay, can you tell me how can I do that? Resizing. Currently, I have DS1 V2. I want to have a higher size. Can I do that? Guys, anyone? So 
So VM's all concept. You remember how to resize? So go to size here. Okay, select the size which you are, uh, which you need. Okay, probably a higher one. So let's say I want. Okay, I don't have size. So I will have to stop this machine. That's fine. So once I stop the virtual machine, I'll have the other sizes and then I'll be able to resize the virtual machine. Okay. So these are the common operations which you will be carrying out when you're working in your company, changing the size of the disk, changing the size of the VM. So depending on the requirement, you will be able to uh, handle these kind of requests. Okay. So this RDP is taking a lot of time. Okay. So let me just go to the other machine. This is okay. This is a good size. I will just start this machine and I'll try to access this. Meanwhile, I'll show you how to create alerts. Okay, so guys, I'm audible, right? There has been no response for it. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Fine. So uh, when you go to monitoring, okay, so you have something called insights wherein you start the insights, okay, for every virtual machine. If like you need any uh, uh, insights, you can just click on enable and you will be able to get the recommendations and stuff. Okay, so that is for all the services which we have discussed applications, virtual machines, storage accounts, containers, and keywords and everything. All the uh, different services which we have on Azure, right? So for all, everything, you will be able to have a um, insight. So I was talking about alerts. Okay, so we are going to create an alert first. First, we will create the action group. So creating alert is three types. One is of three steps. One is creation. The other one is alert rules and the action group. First, we'll create the action group. So click on create action group. Uh, give the resource group name. Uh, make it regional. So action group one go to notifications what is the type of notification you want okay so i would want an email ad email okay so i will just go ahead and set my email address okay i'm going to do uh, i mean i'm going to give my email address okay and the name of the notification okay Gosh, email and what is the action so action type is going to be uh, so this can be skipped if there is a particular action which you want the notification part is done you will receive a notification once the action i mean once the parameter is breached but action is something it's optional okay do you want to attach it to any function or do you want to create to uh, an event hub or you want a service now ticket that needs to be raised okay depending on what action you need so let's say if it is 80 percent above automatically create a itsm ticket itsm is nothing but a service now ticket okay or do you want to create a web hook wherein uh, um, alert will be created on a particular url okay so depending on the action okay you can uh, if you have those particular capabilities you can just go ahead and give them okay click on review and create our basic thing is we need to receive an email once a cpu utilization is about 80 percent okay so that is pretty much what we need okay so action group is created so it is ready I'll just give a refresh. Fine, it is created. Uh, action groups refresh. That's okay. Okay, now what I'll do is I will create a rule. Okay, I'm going to create a rule. So, what is going to be my rule? Okay, so filter by subscription filter by resource type it is for a virtual machine so just click on virtual machines okay and do you want all the locations or whichever location which you are part of so i am going to give west us 3 okay and it will automatically take the suggestions and it will select the resources which are in question okay now let, let's say i have only three i can select the whole resource group i can select everything okay but if you want to explicitly select anything you can do that as well so i have created all a uh, i mean i have taken all the virtual machines of west us 3 now i'm going to give a condition okay so what is the condition cpu okay if the percentage cpu okay and 
it is the threshold is basically uh, it is going to be either st static or dynamic. Okay, static is something which is uh, not going to change and dynamic is something which changes all the time. So if the threshold is like common, it's like uh, continuously above certain limit, then that is static. If it is like touching once and coming back, then that is dynamic. Okay, so threshold, I'm going to put it as static aggregation type. There are, as I showed you, there are like maximum, minimum and sum and total of it. Okay, so I'm going to go with average. Okay, and if it is greater than uh, let us say if it is greater than 70%. Okay. And for every, if the data is, uh, how long do you want the data to be checked? Okay. So that is every one minute it will check. Okay. And how far do you want the data to be fetched? Okay. It's from the last five minutes of activation. Okay. So action group here, you need to select your action group, which you created. Just put it here. Okay, go to details. Okay, and the alert name. What is the alert you need to give? Okay, is it something which is critical? It is error, warning, or information. Okay, so what I want to say, if it is above 70, it's going to be something very critical for me. Okay, so what I need to do is I am setting up a critical alert and I'm giving the alert rule name as uh, high CPU utilization. Okay. This is going to be the alert name and there is going to be a uh, description needs attention. Okay. So this is the alert rule name which I'm giving. And if you want to have any um, properties which you want to add on your own, like for example, uh, if there is something which you need to do, um, like you want to add certain parameters, you can do that in the advanced options. Okay. So once that is done, go to tags. Okay. Review and create. Okay. So what is the criteria? If the CPU percentage is 70%, uh, I want the aggregation to be five minutes. Okay. And uh, sorry, the data should be five minutes and I have to check every one minute. Okay. And the action group is email. Okay. Go ahead and create this particular rule. Okay, so this is pretty much what needs to be done. Okay, so this I have created an alert. Okay, so how am I going to trigger this particular thing? Okay, uh, so we will have to test that, right? So what we are going to do is we are going to create a stress. Okay, that's it. Out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by, by creating an alert rule, we mm -hmm. are giving an email now. Yeah. Uh, that should be only one email or more than one. Usually in a company perspective, it is a DL, okay, distributed list, wherein it is like multiple uh, stakeholders, they will be there and it will be a DL. Okay. But it, this is just for testing, right? So we can we can add yours also, we can add anyone's, so that's not a problem. Okay. But it's usually the stakeholders or the people who are in shift or whatever that is, they, will, they should be able to check that. That is the main purpose of alerting. So I'm going to give a stress now. Okay. Parallelly, I will just open task manager. And we will be able to see the uh, load. Okay. So go to task manager here. Go to more details. Okay. And see, this is the current CPU. 13 percentage is the utilization. Okay. There are chances the server might crash. Okay. But I am okay with that. So let's say. Uh, I want to add. This one, okay. I want to activate a stress, okay. So I'm going to create a thread and I want to activate all of them, okay. So I'm going to do this, okay. There is a good chance the server will break, but yeah, okay, it's up. So currently, what 60 99% utilization, okay. The CPU stress is making sure that the server is 100% utilized. Okay, so this is the stress. Okay, now before that, okay, I have set up the alert. Everything looks good. Let me go to my email ID and confirm that I am okay to receive the notification. Okay, so I am currently in the action group. Okay, you don't have to acknowledge. You have been added. Okay, that's good. Fine. Yeah, so once this is done, okay, I am that is fine. Once I get a alert, I should be able to. Uh, now let us monitor the utilization. Okay, go to metrics. Or we can go to the VM metrics and we can directly check. 
okay we can directly check okay this is going to be my windows machine uh yeah one alert is already there it's a critical alert of high cpu utilization good it's working our alerting system is working so you see here for the past one hour this is my cpu utilization 100 percent cpu utilization okay now i should be able to see a message Let's just wait for. So that alert will come, okay? So it should come. We'll just wait. I'll just give a refresh. Probably I should have the alert. Did the CPU utilization go down? No, still right. Okay. Ah, I have it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is the this is how your alert is going to look like. Okay. Your major monitor alert was triggered. Uh, there is going to be a high. There was this high CPU utilization. Okay. And what is the description? High CPU utilization need attention. What is the? Uh, sorry, not this. What is the resource ID? Okay. Which resource has been impacted? Windows one. Okay. So that is the resource ID which we are talking about. Okay. This is the Windows ID. Okay. So. Uh, metric name is CPU utilization and this is the details and what is the period over the last five minutes and it is greater than 70%. What is the value? 79 percentage. Okay. This is how alerts get generated. So this is how you create alerts and alerts can be created for any service irrespective of the uh, service. Okay. So for example, if I want to create alert for my SQL database, which we created the other day, we can very well do that as well. Okay. So go to the SQL database. Okay. Go to click on uh, alerts. Okay. So click on alerts and you will be able to see the alert rule, which you can create with respect to the SQL database. Okay. So this is the parameters. So data space allocated or uh, like, for example, if the CPU utilization is high, okay, if it is greater than a certain percentage, then you will get an alert for your SQL database as well. So alert monitoring logs diagnostics. It is common for all the services irrespective of the services. You can do it. Okay, and you can manage that centrally in this particular space. Okay. So this space is where you can manage all of these. Okay, so that is with respect to your alerting system. Okay, any doubts? Anything till this point? Anything which you're not clear about? Or any security breaches also we can set alert now. Security breaches, virus attack. Uh, maybe virus or malware. Uh, or no, if, or no, if no, anybody, no. somebody trying to if if I, if I am in some other shift. But uh, I am only the granted person to use that uh, virtual machine. But uh, no, in no, some that other is shift, not possible. What you can do is uh, you can monitor from the platform. Okay, inside the OS is your responsibility. You can do that in the event logs. Okay. Okay. okay not from the VM. Uh, this is not from here. It is not possible. But from the event logs, you can. Okay. I'll just deactivate these. Okay. I will just, uh, yeah, one minute. Once this is done, it will be back to normal. Okay. We are just deactivating the CPU stress. Okay. So you can try this activity by yourself. Okay. You can just create a VM and give some 
uh, stress onto it. Okay, and you can do not try it on your laptop; it will get stuck. Okay, do not ever try this on the laptop. Okay, so this is going to initiate some stress on your machine, and uh, yeah, be careful while using this tool. Okay, so yeah, now we can see the utilization is going to be normal. Yeah. If you are trying this uh, CPU stress tool in our laptop. Yeah. It is get hanged. If you restart, it will go, no? Yeah, it will go. It will go. It will go. Nothing more than that. Uh, Nothing will, more. You will get damaged. Fine, but don't try it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, fine. Okay. Uh, the next topic, uh, what we are going to discuss is uh, basically I want to cover basics of DevOps. Okay. So I'll just cover basics of what is going to happen. Okay. So uh, when we talk about DevOps, uh, you have certain parameters. Okay. So why do we need DevOps? Do you have idea about that? Why you need DevOps? What is DevOps? No idea about DevOps. Fine. Okay. So uh, basically, DevOps is nothing but it is a combination of development and operations. Okay. It is a combination of development and operations. Okay. So so the processes that are involved. Okay. When a person is going to let's say you have a product. Okay. You have a website. Okay. Now let's say you have a website. It's a full running website. Uh, and there are some changes that you need to make. Okay, so earlier before DevOps came into picture. Okay, so there are certain things which uh, were being used. Okay, before DevOps came into picture, you had something called a waterfall model. Okay, so if this is your website. Okay, so what used to happen here is like one by one. Okay, now let's say this is like a waterfall. Okay, so this is going to be the building phase. Okay, and this is the testing phase. Okay, and the deployment phase, the deployment phase. Okay, so and I think there is one more also, which is coding phase, code, build, test, and deploy. Okay, so your customer, okay, whoever is your customer, is going to come up to you, okay, and he is going to say, "This is my requirement. This is what I need to do." Okay, so the customer is going to interact at, let's say, uh, the coding phase. That is, he has given his requirement. This is my so and so requirement. I need. This is what I need. Require. Okay, so he's uh, given you that particular thing. So what will happen now is once he has given you the requirement, this is his first interaction. Okay, so this is going to be his first interaction with you. He has given you the requirement. What you do, you start, you start coding, you build the tool. Okay, and then you test it and you deploy it. Okay, so now if the customer in between, so this is going to take, let's say, six months. Okay, this particular uh, thing is going to take six months. Okay, customer. Meanwhile, within that six months, a lot of things can change. So, customer says that, look, I have said you in my first interaction, this is what I want. But uh, what happens while you are at the process of building? Okay, so let's say while you're testing it, okay, he comes up with another change. Okay, so what is going to happen is that is not going to happen. The interaction will not happen. The next interaction for the customer is going to happen once you deploy. Okay. And then what will happen? The process will repeat again. You will write a new code and then you will build it again, test it again, and deploy it again. So the interaction is going to be for one complete cycle. You cannot in between interrupt or you cannot do anything in between. Okay. So that is the waterfall model. Okay. So it's like a waterfall. It just flows here, flows here, flows here, and deployment okay so this is the shortcoming the cx interaction is going to be very very less for you he's going to interact at the first phase and he's going to interact at the final phase okay there's no interaction between building or testing if he needs to make any changes also that's not going to happen okay so that is called waterfall model but when you come to devops okay devops is much more powerful okay so what is going to happen in devops is you have a circle okay so it is going to be like this this is built and this is test. Okay, and this is going to be uh, uh, deploy. Okay, and then this is going to be monitor. Okay, so all these things are interrelated to each other. Okay, so basically, when you do all of these, okay, they are going to be interrelated to each other. Okay, so basically, when you try to build something. Okay, so let's say I'm trying to build this. 
I'm trying to build. Okay, so these all these first building is done, then testing, then deployment, then monitoring. So if there is any changes, then you can alter, you can make alteration in the middle. So that is possible with the help of DevOps. Okay, so that is one thing which we need to keep in mind. That is how waterfall model failed and we went into agile methodology. Okay, so that is the major shortcoming. Agile methodology is the second one, and then we introduce DevOps. Okay, now with DevOps, it is going to be a pipeline. Okay, it is basically going to be a pipeline. So, what will happen is this is my pipeline. Okay, so first we are going to have a uh, build, uh, we have coding, and then we have building, and then we have uh, Testing and then deployment. Okay, so this is pretty much what is going to happen in a DevOps pipeline. Okay, all these things are going to happen automatically. So what is going to happen here? It is called continuous integration. Okay, so one term is CI, which is basically continuous integration. Okay, and second thing is CD, which is basically continuous deployment. Okay, so these are the things that are going to happen continuous integration and continuous deployment. Okay, so when you talk about these terminologies, when you talk about DevOps, the main concept is CI and CD, where you're going to create pipelines and using those pipelines, you're going to create an ecosystem which is going to run for you. Okay, so that is the concept of DevOps development and operations. You are mixing both of them. You're not going to keep them separate. You're going to create development and operations as such. OK, so that is the concept of DevOps. OK, any doubts? Anything which you're not clear about? Uh, can you please explain that pipeline model how it works so basically when the developer is going to push a code okay he's going to push the code here the code will go into building okay so building okay and then it will go to testing and then it is going to deployment so what is going to happen is when a devops engineer is going to build a a certain ecosystem or certain environment. Okay, he is going to make sure that he's going to build a pipeline. So everything is automated from fetching the code. If he's going to detect any changes made in the code, that is going to build automatically. That is going to be tested automatically, and then that will deploy automatically. Okay, so that is the concept. So the pipeline you're talking about is the whole automation behind it. It it has the automation behind it. So the code will be pulled and it will be built and then it will be tested and then it will be deployed. So at the end of the day, the customer is going to see the end product, which is the deployed product. OK, and if there is any changes that are made in the ecosystem, if there is any change made in the code, it is again going to take it, build it, test it and deploy it. Everything is automated. So when you talk about the code, where is the code going to be stored? It is going to be stored in a tool called Git. OK, or it is also famously known as GitHub. OK, you're going to store it in GitHub. And when you are pulling it for building or when you're creating a pipeline that is going to be on Jenkins. OK, and you're going to test it using a tool uh, like Selenium or whatever it is automation testing or manual testing, depending on that and deploy. Where are you going to deploy Azure AWS? You're going to use containers. You're going to use Kubernetes and all of these. So depending on what you have configured in your pipeline. OK, so that is going to constitute of your whole DevOps thing. OK, so I cannot tell you what exactly is going to happen when you create a pipeline. OK, so that is the that is going to be a new course altogether. OK, so these are the tools that is going to be um, like used. OK, Jenkins to create a pipeline. OK, you're going to use Jenkins to create a pipeline and then you will use tools like Maven or Ant to build the package. Whatever package you have created, you will build that and then you will do testing and then you will send it to the deployment where it will be deployed on a virtual machine or it will be deployed on a uh, ACS, which is container service, or it will uh, use Kubernetes, which is basically AKS. All these things it will automatically deploy, but that will depend on your pipeline, how your pipeline is configured. OK, so that will, that is the whole summary or whole just about how uh, your DevOps is going to work. That, that means if the customer is interrupting at the at any stage of the uh, before deployment, it can be done. Yeah, it can be done. 
so that is possible yes but but the cost will be uh, much costlier than waterfall no 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 what you can basically do is you can create a cutover like let's say if this is my main feature this is my app okay then i can create a, another pipeline which can do the same thing but it is going to do it parallelly so now let's just say this is your main code and this is one of your you found a bug and you are going to use this bug and you are going to uh, put, write a code about it then what you are going to do is you are not going to put it here and do the whole process again it is going to use this bug and you are going to test it and you are going to deploy it building is already done right working working yeah so that is pretty much what it is going to happen that will be uh, done separately yes side separately. by side, side separately. by side right right, right. Okay, fine. And apart from that, uh, I have just one more topic, which is basically our back. Okay, role-based access. Okay, so depending on what role you have, you can access that particular resource. So any resource, irrespective of which service you are using. Okay, you have something called our back. Okay, so since you are all owners of your account, you will have. administrative access so you are something called as account admin okay but there are roles like contributor and uh, uh, reader and all of those so depending on what role you have you will be able to uh, do certain things and you will not be able to do certain things in the virtual machine okay so i am going to check my access okay i am going to check my access so let's say this is this is the account so has full access to all the resources in the subscription okay now let's say I, this is my azure ad okay this is azure active directory and let's say i want to add a new user let's say i want to bring in someone who's new to the company i want to add a new user to the company okay so what i'll do is i can do two two things i can just create a user or i can just uh, invite him to this particular thing okay so i'm going to create a user so let's just say this is the user which i want okay and the name of the user and apart from that let me create a new password for him okay and i am going to uh there is, do you want to like restrict him to a particular location you can do that as well and if you want to give him any role you can give that okay so basically i'm going to create a user okay and then we can assign him permissions okay so now let's go to users here okay and you will be able to see the new user which was created okay we have currently two users the first one is member the other one is also member but the permission is going to vary okay this one is going to have a lot of other permissions he is going to be the Uh, account admin okay and apart from that this particular user which is the new one which we created okay we can check the roles what we have assigned okay so go to assign role and we will be able to see what is the role okay we do not have any role here but if we check the other one okay i think we should be able to check the other one as well so this particular user manoranjan sahu okay just go to assign roles and you can check that he is a global administrator that means he has access to all the resources in this particular subscription okay so depending on the role of that particular user okay you can assign them permissions okay so go to assign roles click on add assignments and here you should be able to give them the requested permission okay so you can have a global administrator or you can give him global reader depending on see so he can manage all aspects of azure ad microsoft services that use azure ad identities so what i have done is i have given him a global administrator same as what i had in the different account the same permission i have given it to him okay so uh, basically um, this is this is what is going to happen okay this one is going to be the account administrator okay and he will be able to now access anything okay so now i can check okay i can go ahead and check in this virtual machine whether he will be able to access or not okay so go to the virtual machine go to access control check access search by name okay go ahead and search by name and check okay so it has not reflected it usually takes 5 to 10 minutes to reflect once that is done you should be able to see that what is the role assignment he or she is having on this particular thing okay so this is pretty much regarding the active directory settings okay and also what you can do is you can create uh, 
groups okay you can create groups wherein you can it this is like a normal ad okay so now let's say uh, do you know a, a normal active directory how an active directory is going to work yeah a little bit okay fine so an active directory is basically it's a server okay which is going to now let's say there is a concept called domain okay domain is nothing but abc.com okay that is an example of a domain so because yeah actually i know little bit you just confirm with yeah, yeah i am no 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 i am i'm i'm telling from the basic okay so let's say you have a domain okay and that is called abc.com so your domain will have a lot of users okay it will have lot of users these user settings or user details or user credential is stored in a server called an active directory server okay so this is basically a windows server okay which is going to centrally manage all your users of that particular domain so now let's say if you are creating a account on a particular domain okay that needs to be part of the active directory okay so if it is not part of the active directory then you will not be able to authenticate but if i show you this particular virtual machine i can show you that this is not a domain this is actually a work group machine okay so one minute i can show you here this pc right click properties here i can show you this is a work group machine okay so if it is part of a domain then it needs to be controlled by an active directory or the term for active directory is also called a domain controller okay a domain controller will basically store the user details what are the users are there what is the permission of that user on the particular virtual machine okay so now i got one doubt yeah 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 if we are create one while we are creating virtual machine we are giving uh, 2019 server 2016 server 2020 server and all now mm -hmm. at that time whether it will be acted as work group or it will be uh, created with the, all the services like uh, currently uh, you mean the vms which we create those are work groups unless okay. and until you don't add it to the ad it's going to be a work group machine Okay, okay. Just like how you work on your normal servers, right? Same concept. Unless and until you don't add it to a domain, it's not going to be part of a domain. Okay. okay. Once it is part of the domain, then you'll have Active Directory in picture. Okay. We have to manually do that. Correct. Correct. Okay. So that is the concept of uh, Active Directory. Okay. So when, so what is now possible is if your domain is hosted on Azure. Okay. Let's just say that your domain is hosted on Azure. Then what you can do is. this particular thing okay whichever we are talking about here is not going to be here it is going to be on azure okay so whoever users are part of this let's say you have a user uh, felix at uh, microsoft.com you have a user which is part of this ad and you have a vm which is part of the same ad okay then he will be able to authenticate so what i am meaning to say is you no longer need to create this particular virtual machine okay you can directly create a azure ad on azure portal okay and you can centrally manage this particular domain okay so that is the azure ad integration for all the uh, domains which are there okay you can migrate your uh, current domain or current active directory to Azure. Okay, so that is also possible. Okay, so these uh, are the. No doubt, Akash. Yeah, yeah. If you are giving, if you are creating Azure AD, can we do? Can we uh, match that Azure AD to more than one VM? Yeah, you can. No, Azure AD is just like your Active Directory. It's your Active Directory on cloud. Okay, whoever is part of the domain will be able to own the ticket. So now let's say you have ten VMs, which is part of the domain. Okay, following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 VMs which are part of domain. Okay. Yeah. Now, my Azure AD is just like my Active Directory. So, what is its purpose? It is going to authenticate users. It's going to say this has access, this does not have access. That's it. Okay. Irrespective of provide, number of VMs. If we provide permission to access more than one or two VMs, he will be getting access. No, it's not like that. Oh, uh, yeah. You can say like that. Depending on the user, it can like access. Yeah. For example, I am the user. You are the AD controller, Azure AD controller. Okay. I am requesting permission from VM one and VM two for mm -hmm. both accessing both the VMs. Mm -hmm. I can assign you the permission. permission. Yeah. You can give the permission. Right. Right. I can give it on the whole, or I can give it one by one also. Both are possible. Okay. 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 Yeah. sure so that is pretty much about azure active directory you can migrate your existing ones you can create groups 
like just like you create groups on your active directory you can create groups as well and you can give the permissions and everything all of those is possible here on azure active directory as well okay so all these things are possible with respect to azure active directory and if you want to do multi factor authentication for any of your user accounts which you have created on azure ad you can enable multi factor authentication as well okay so let's say you want to reset a particular thing okay you want to reset uh, a user password you can do that as well okay and uh, uh, i was showing you mfa right multi factor authentication so if you want to enable multi factor authentication for any user you can do that as well okay so this is all paid service which is going to be there only on premium accounts so i will just tell you like let's say you have multiple users and you want to enable mfa that means uh, you need two authentication one is password and then the otp to your mobile number you can enable that using multi factor authentication okay or you can use the microsoft authenticator app which will also help you to authenticate your request okay so these are the things which are available on azure ad you have uh, uh, on premises active directory integration you have b2b which is basically business to business okay and b2c okay all these concepts are there in azure ad okay and you can also add users you can add groups you can delegate permissions you can delegate permissions based on the resource uh, the level of access and all of these can, can be controlled in azure ad okay so the concept or the outline which is basically followed is role based access control okay role based access control so depending on your role whatever role you, you are an intern you get a read only access if you are a high level employee then you get a contributor access if you are just a sql guy who wants to see the virtual machine you just get the reader access so depending on your role you will be getting the access levels okay so that is with respect to azure ad okay so any questions anything which are not clear about Akash, is there any relation between uh, Azure AD and availability? availability? Oh, no, no, no. 